you know, being able to get this many talented people in a room to talk around an issue and how to talk about moving an issue forward is critical to any community. But how we talk about how we're going to solve homelessness in the future is even more critical. So join with me today in welcoming Lloyd Pendleton to this conversation. Lloyd is that special breed of person who blends robust involvement in the private sector at Ford Motor Company with a deep career in a faith-based institution, the LDS Church, and blends the two unique experiences to inform his current position. During his 26 years of working with the LDS Church's Welfare Department, Lloyd was loaned out twice to assist with restructuring two separate nonprofit organizations that served low-income and homeless populations. It was there where he gained a better understanding of the needs of the homeless citizens in the community. With this background, he was loaned a third time to assist with the development and implementation of the state of Utah's 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness by the end of 2015. And with the 2015 point in time homeless count, the state had reduced their chronic homeless population by 91%. I think that deserves applause. And they are on track to have the balance of uh, those that are needing housing by the 2006 point in time count. That is impressive. Lloyd is speaking to us twice today. Right now he's stepping up in for Zoe LeBeau, who was unable to be with us. He and Zoe have been collaborating with, collaborating with the state of Colorado on this next topic. So please join with me in giving Lloyd a warm Colorado Springs welcome. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And Zoe sends her apologies that she's not able to attend, and so I appreciate the opportunity to fill in for her. And Matt, where are you? You left. I just want to tell you thanks for your enthusiasm, your interest, and your nerdyism, as you self-proclaim, and passion about taking that scientific material concerning the brain and the impact in our early years where there's trauma. Because understanding that becomes crucially important, I have found, as we serve those that are in those kinds of situations. Very, very important that we understand that and develop those relationships. So I'm going to take a few moments and talk about housing first. I thought Deanna mentioned that Utah was using the housing first model. Uh, we're not the only one, everyone. You're using the housing first model here, but we want to talk about, and Ron, the slides are not there. They disappeared. Um, so I'm going to talk about the housing first model, the concept, what it deals with, and so, um, basically, it was developed in New York City by Samson Barris. And he went out and he was dealing, they were serving the homeless individuals that had severe mental health issues. And they began asking them, what is it you need? And they said, housing. He said, well, we don't do housing, we do mental health treatment. He kept asking the question and began to realize that they needed housing. And so he took the risk, 20, almost 18, 19 years ago, said, we'll put them into housing first. And it, they began to find good results. So it's basically taking the person who's mentally ill, substance abuser, uh, long term on long time on the street, and put them in the housing, and wrap services around them. Bring in the case manager, the medical person, psychiatrist, the psychologist, the ACT team, and put them together. And they began to realize that they found good results. And so they studied that and found that. 85%, 88% would still be housed after the first year. And this is taking them right off the street. So this was a new idea that was breaking the mold of the old idea of housing ready. <clears throat> Which basically said that, um, you know, the whole housing ready piece is that you need to be clean, dry, and sober before you could go into housing. And if you fell off the wagon while you're in housing, then you lost your case management and you lost your housing. So the housing ready uh, model has been pretty well, it shows that it doesn't work. Few situations that might work uh, for those that are fairly functional, but for those that are chronically illness and have issues, that does not work well. So that became 
that was tested and proven work, you know, that it, that it worked. And so HUD started that whole process. And for us in Utah, we became aware of that and we were just starting our 10-year planning process and approved our plan in 2005. And the spring of that year, I was in Las Vegas and met Samson Barris, riding back to the, heard him speak, but, you know, group like this, but on the way to the airport, he was on the, the shuttle and I was there and we had a chance to become personally acquainted. I was in May. We invited him to come out in June and we basically had him talk to the political leaders or service providers about this idea and we decided that we were going to do this and that we were going to do the housing first model. But the problem was in the West, and I don't know about here on the front, but over on the Wasatch front, ideas from New York City and Washington, D.C. are looked at with suspicion. <laughs> they think they have all the answers. But the research was there, so we agreed that we would go and give that a test. And so we were into the pilots because we have found that taking new ideas that you begin to take a look at low risk, low cost, and do a pilot, and we agreed to do 20 over the next 22 months where we build 100 units because there was real angst about putting 100 units, 100 people in 100 units in one spot that were long-term homeless. And so we basically agreed to do a pilot while that was being built. And I was right on a ranch and, learned, and uh, had to chop the wood for our stove and the coal stove. <clears throat> and I learned to chop the big end of the log first. So I said, if we're going to do a pilot, we're going to do the most challenging, difficult, chronically homeless people we can find. And we'll house them in a scattered site situation. And if they can be housed, then we know anybody can be housed. And 22 months later, all 17 were still housed. We became believers. <clears throat> Case managers, executive directors, politicians, staff, we became believers, and then I'll talk about what we did in my next presentation. But it proved to us it worked in Salt Lake City and in the state of Utah. So then we moved forward in pretty robust uh, aspect of it. Another element of this is that there's housing right. <clears throat> this is one of the philosophies that housing is a right. That idea doesn't sell well in Utah. There's accountability and issues, and so you can argue both side. Is it a right, or is, as a community, do we make it a commitment that we'll give a housing opportunity? And we in Utah have agreed that we will give a housing opportunity to every chronically homeless person and every homeless veteran by the end of 2015, and, and, and we're basically there. On December 15th, we are committed to get the other 42 homeless veterans housed, and we're down to a couple hundred in the chronically homeless. So we feel it's a community obligation and opportunity to provide that. So that you can argue besides the housing right. Um, housing services uh, are two separate areas. The housing is important and the services. And if you're going to do chronically homeless housing, you need to have the case management. So we committed state dollars out of a homeless trust fund to provide the money for the case managers. That was a very important piece because that's usually the more difficult piece to get together. So your funders collaborative, if you have them here, the United Way, the private businesses. As you begin to bring up these 65 units and your other several hundred units that you're going to need, make sure you have the case management as part of your process because it will not work if you don't have that support case management. Those relationships, <clears throat> that opportunity for them now that they're stabilized or in housing to stabilize and begin to integrate back into the community. So it's affordable rental housing with supportive services. And, uh, and they, you know, the goal is to get them stabilized and integrate back into the community. The benefits reduce the stress, crisis, all the things that Matt talked about, significantly reduce the recidivism rates and cycle of homelessness. That's how you end homelessness. You put them into housing, pretty simple. That's pretty simple. And so there are benefits from it. Targeted populations, the homeless, long-term chronically homeless, difficult criminal backgrounds. There's a long list that this can apply to. For us, we've targeted chronically homeless individuals and chronic homeless families. We have done some chronic, some permanent supportive housing for chronic homeless families and for our homeless veterans. We have not gone down this but, list, but all of these, housing is very important as you begin to look at addressing all those issues. For us, we have found you target certain populations and make it happen. If you try to do all of them at once, it's spread too thin and too shallow, and you will not get the results that you want. So we have targeted it. So, <clears throat> why do supportive housing reduction out of you know 
you know, out of home placements, increase in employment. So all of the benefits that can come in dealing with the getting stabilized. And we have about 30% of our people, of our thousand or so in the housing, prim supportive housing, have income through employment. Not full-time employment, but our objective and goal is every one of our individuals in chronic homeless housing or prim supportive housing will increase their income through employment. We've made that a commitment. It may take three years, but we've committed to get them the opportunity to increase their income through employment. And we've committed to case managers that they will do that. Not that they'll give them the opportunity, but they will actually increase their income through employment. That's therapeutic. That's part of the accountability. That's part of the responsibility. Part of that learning process we think is very important. <clears throat> Trauma. Matt talked about this very extensively. The impact. And for me, um, I heard about the harm reduction and the trauma issues many years ago. Somebody was starting the harm reduction approach in, the, uh, in Salt Lake City, and they were going out and giving clean needles and condoms. And I said, what? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Just tell them to stop doing that stuff. <laughs> that was my solution. Because I've seen the hobos and the homeless people many years ago, and I said, uh, get a job you lazy bums. I said those things because I felt that way, because I was reared in poverty, on a ranch, social poverty, but you learn to work, and so I assumed everybody could work. So personally, I've had to morph, and I've, great, gratefully I have morphed and changed in my understanding and my approach and my compassion to reach out and to realize <clears throat> I need to change as much as they need to change. This expectation that I'm going to expect you to change to my way of thinking and my way of behaving doesn't work. So one of the thoughts I would suggest to you is you need to be changing as much as they need to be changing and how you deal with their issues and your issues and your belief windows and your understanding. We think we have the answers. And we project them. Thou should do this, and you should do this. I have a sign in my office that says, Thou shalt not shouldest all over thyself. <laughs> <clears throat> so trauma is an issue. And we're getting more understanding because of Matt and the information you're getting at. We need to have you come to Utah and talk to us. We're going to arrange that. That's really valuable information. That's relevant, meaningful information for us who pride ourselves in serving those that are less fortunate. Harm reduction, this whole approach, as I mentioned, I've had to change in this process. It becomes a very important process. Programs and practices uh, reduce the adverse health, social, economic consequences, use of legal and illegal activities without necessarily reducing substance consumption. We need to meet the people where they are. We have found that once they get into housing, the self-medication goes down significantly because their stuff is safe. It's safe. They're safe. And then the case manager comes by on a regular basis. For us, Samson Bear says that case manager, as a resident, you have to see your case manager every week. We don't have that for us. We basically say, uh, you're here in housing, retreatment's not required, but our case managers are required to go and see them regularly. Somehow, coffee clutch, the mail, the laundry room, because we built them, they have to come down to the laundry in one location, pick up their mail. The case manager is required to develop that relationship and start to engage them. Gave a tour two days ago to a reporter from Portland, Maine. Case manager basically said, Nine months, the person finally said to me, and this was somebody that didn't like this case manager, wandered into her office, saw the empty chair by her desk, and said, ah, oh, this chair looks empty. I'm just going to sit down. And then she started to talk and started to talk because over the months, this case manager had begun to develop a relationship just in the hall, saying hi, talking. This lady poured out her heart began the healing process in a greater process in a greater degree. 
So those relationships become very important. <clears throat> Some basic principles. Poverty and health and drug. Um, you work to minimize to learn from, uh, in, you know, they're not required to give that up. But you begin to take a look. How do we deal with this whole situation? Uh, alcohol, drug is a spectrum. Uh, absent, it's, absentism, absenteeism is not required. It's part of the process, but they need to begin to make that choice to, to begin to say, I want to make the change. I now want to go to treatment. Okay, we have a treatment program ready for you. But they then make the choice when they're ready. I found that when I'm ready to make a choice and make a change, I'm much more accepting to my wife's suggestions. <laughs> I need to be ready. After 49 years, I'm still getting better. So that's the same, I think, for all of us. And that's one of the things, and I think Matt's information is very, very helpful. Just, as he said, we need to be making changes. We need to be making changes, not projecting them always onto the other person. Overall quality of life and individual principles, harm reduction, advocates, uh, non-judgmental. I really came out of teenagehood pretty judgmental. I had a pretty clear view of how the world ought to work, and I had good opinions, and as I went through college and got into work, um, I learned years later when I began to modify a little bit, people were terrified of me, because I came on pretty strong, I was pretty confrontational, because I was committed to getting the job done and very task-oriented. So I've worked over the years, and I have marked in my understanding to get rid of the judgments, accept the person where they are, they're a human being, they have a story, and their story's been pretty traumatic if they're homeless and on the street, and has been mentioned through several presentations today. I need to hear that story. I need to walk in their shoes. I need to have empathy, as Matt talked about. Honor them. For me, they're one of God's child children. They're one of my brothers, they're one of my sisters. Now, they may be whatever color, I met uh, a diamond yesterday, and I went to the restaurant last night. <clears throat> there was a homeless guy out, so I talked to him. He had just come in from Little Rock, Arkansas. So I had a chance to chat with him, get his story. I sent him my love. I didn't bring him into the dinner, because I thought people wouldn't have enjoyed that. But he likes Colorado Springs. He thinks he'll stay. I'm saying, you sure you don't want to go south for the winter? He said, no, I like it here. Hearing their story, very important. Includes the client and all the decisions and the services offered to them. Yeah, here's some options. Here's a service. Yeah, I'm not ready. Yeah, they ignore it. We need to provide the services when they're ready. Harm reduction recognizes the self-healing quality of individuals and seeks to empower them to share and support each other in the strategies to reduce harm. They're in the discussion, they're in the process. Recognize social inequalities, co-occurring conditions. <clears throat> we have the capacity to change to some level. We all have the capacity to change. We know that about 50% of the people we put in permanent supportive housing will stabilize and probably die there, 40 to 50%. We have 10% a year that move out the successful, successful outcome. 2% a year die. 2% walk away. But they have changed those that stay there. They've stabilized, they've reconnected with family, children, brothers and sisters, parents. They can change. There is real danger and harm, so we don't minimize that. Recognize that. But here again, it's still their choice. So harm reduction, recognize absence of you know, behavior by ideal outcome. Harm reduction promotes the low threshold, substance use and coping with mechanism. You can read through those. The goal is any positive step. And we had to work very diligently to recognize the small positive steps 
because we have a tendency to look for big steps that come, big outcomes. And that personally was an issue for me because I'm so task-oriented and goal-oriented. Recognizing small steps and giving them that recognition and that support becomes very important. Because <clears throat> another thing for me that I learned in this whole process, as I was traveling around the state doing this work, a lady gave me a book called Bridges Out of Poverty. Three months later, got to it and read it. And it opened my whole vista of this whole process. Because you go to conferences, you read a book, uh, and every now and then there's one that just changes your whole paradigm. That one did it for me. Because it basically told me there's a language in poverty, there's a language in middle class, and there's a language in wealth. And I observed it. And I would be reared in poverty. It told me what I had done and how I got out of that mindset. But I also observed that most of our case managers were middle class. And they were using their language, dealing with people in poverty. And many times that was not an effective relationship. So I brought the authors in, and we taught hundreds of case managers about this whole new language process. I got certified to teach it. And so I went around and teaching hundreds of our case managers because not only do we put them in housing and use motivational interviewing, but this whole process of beginning to understand their language. Because in poverty, there's no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. Dr. Comer, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. So for me, for the first few years, I made my first task when I met somebody new to develop a relationship. What was that time? Five? Okay. I made it an issue that I would develop a relationship. I would take the time and develop that relationship. Because if I didn't do that with somebody in poverty, <clears throat> it was noise any information I gave them. So this whole process becomes important, and Matt talked about that relationship. <clears throat> that teacher, that case manager, that individual that cared or that cares. Vitally important. <clears throat> Motivational interviewing, strength-based approach. See, and I don't know if you've done this, but I've done it. I catch somebody doing something wrong I get, as a gotcha. I've had to get over that. Still working on it. <clears throat> I generally don't verbalize it. But I also realize and I've learned that I need to just basically get it out of my system because people in poverty have a vocabulary of about four to 800 words. So they learn to read nonverbal cues really well. So the feelings and judgments and things, I, whatever you have, I have in myself. If I'm projecting, I may not verbalize it, but they will read it. They're really skilled in nonverbal cues. So I need to be showing love, kindness, compassion. They will sense it. They won't trust it at first, but as that continues, then they say, ah, Lloyd really does care. I can share my story. The lady that came in after nine months and sat down with that case manager opened up. That's what we want. Then it's information what we share with them. <clears throat> Keep asking yourself, are we really allowing the tenant to make their own choices? Understand the impact of trauma and its relationship with harmful behavior, as we've heard. Trauma-informed care, this whole process. Trauma has no boundaries. I bet if we heard everybody's story here, there's some trauma somewhere. Many of us have been able to deal with it effectively. Some of us may still feel the, feel the res re residual impact. <clears throat> so, housing first, put them in there, wrap services, harm reduction approach, develop relationships, and it's magic. It's magic. And what I observed, people, case managers, get burned out because they're working hard and not seeing results. When you're getting results, you may work harder, but you're excited and you're alive and you go to work because you want to, not because you have to for the paycheck. 
getting results becomes very important. Seeing those small changes, recognizing those, supporting one another. So that's a little bit of information about Housing First harm reduction approach. So I've been asked for you to think for a few moments about your attitude, or I'm, this is my question, not theirs. <clears throat> your attitude, is it judgmental? Is it condemning? And secondly, how is your relationship with your coworkers, and especially those you serve? I would suggest you examine that and then share with your neighbor after about a minute or two and share with them how you think you can improve your own capacity and ability to develop a better relationship with those with whom you work, and especially those that you serve. Thank you.